Hi, Richard Veal from Code University. Today I'm talking about why we should report colorimetry data in every paper. So today I cover two problems. First is what I call the experimental problem, and that is basically the problem that uh, display technology that we use for experiments is predicated on human vision. And not only that, but the data formats that when we store it in our computer and that we feed to our models are also predicated on human vision, which can lead to problems when you're doing animal modeling animals. Um, also, people tend to not understand what the representation in the computer is and thus to use it incorrectly in models. So first I'll cover the experimental problem. And first there's a little bit of background necessary. Uh, so first, what color is this leaf? Right? Of course humans will say it's green. Uh, natural color is composed of many different wavelengths of light from 400 to 700, the sort of human visual wavelength uh, spectrum, uh, and uh, this is, of course, caused by reflection of sort of natural light. So, for example, here's uh, the spectrum, uh, spectral power distribution of, uh, of sort of sunlight. And so sunlight looks like this. You know, it's distributed between, you know, 400 and 900, uh, 900 nanometers. It has some you know, infrared point here. But if you look at what's reflected by the leaf, of course, the, the blues in this 600 nanometers are absorbed for photosynthesis. Uh, and it reflects back these 500, mid-500 nanometer and uh, infrared wavelengths, which is why it looks green to us. And it looks green to us because, of course, uh, the human uh, M cone, medium wavelength cone, uh, is primarily uh, 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 picking up these uh, medium 520, 535, 40 nanometer wavelengths that are reflected by it. Whereas the uh, long wavelength cone, uh, is, which is centered about you know, I don't know, you know, 600 uh, uh, nanometers, uh, doesn't pick up a lot of that infrared, but uh, captures this, is mostly sensitive to this area where that the leaf is absorbing. Similar to the S-cone is sensitive to this area that the leaf is also absorbing. Um, and so these three types uh, of cones are what guides sort of human perception of color. There's also the rod that would have a, a response somewhere around here, but uh, they'd be saturated in this situation. And so the response of the human cones will look like this. The short wavelength cones would have low, respo uh, low response. The M cones would be sort of highly activated. And the L cones would also have a relatively low response. Um, of course, if we want to do an experiment with the picture, we might say, oh, let's take a picture of the leaf. Well, we have a digital camera or a natural film camera, which has different sensors or chemicals that are uh, sensitive to different wavelengths of light at different amounts. And so, for example, you have different sort of pixel sensitive uh, areas in your camera's uh, uh, imaging sensor uh, that sense, for example, uh, uh, sensor one, sensor two, sensor three, which detect sort of bluish, greenish, and reddish light. Very narrow, uh, very good sensors these are, very accurate. But then, of course, we want to show that picture on our computer for our experiments, so we show it on our computer. Let's say we use an LCD monitor. LCD monitors have elements, blue, green, and red, uh, red uh, uh, primary elements that emit frequencies that have this power distribution. So the blue one actually doesn't have just a single peak. It has some sort of weird peaks down around 450 and around uh, under 500. Uh, green has one primary peak at 540, 550, but also a secondary one less than 500. And red has a primary peak around 640, 650, but it also has some, of course, other noise over here, right? So you're not showing only uh, single uh, wavelengths that were uh, recorded by your camera, but you're showing these uh, other sort of more complex wavelengths. Let's simplify that and say that your computer monitor only outputs, you know, this wavelength, this strength of uh, this wavelength, and this strength of this wavelength, which when sensed by your different cones in your eyes, in your retina, would uh, result in uh, 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 S-cone response, M-cone response, and L-cone response of about the same amount that you'd see when you viewed the actual leaf in normal sunlight, right? And this is, of course, called metamerism. Uh, even though there's two totally different sort of spectral power distributions, they look exactly the same to humans. And this is a type of anti-aliasing, but it's advantageous because it lets us build you know, cameras and monitors that uh, uh, are you know, much cheaper than building them with you know, millions of different pixels that have different colors, which would be probably impossible. So what's the problem with this? Well, as you can already imagine, uh, this becomes a problem when you deal with non-humans, right? So, for example, uh, the fictional predator here, uh, which, if you've seen the movie, can see Arnold's body heat. So, he let's say he can see infrared. Let's say that he has an S cone, same as humans, an ML cone, same as sort of a, a colorblind, red-green colorblind human, and he also has an extra long wavelength cone that senses infrared. Of course, this is unrealistic. Really, it would have to be really long wavelength uh, infrared to see body heat, but, you know, it's fictional anyway, so you'll have to bear with me. So Arnold, a human, would see, you know, the natural leaf. It would look green. 
To the predator, it might look really different. For example, with his near-infrared wavelengths, it might look slightly reddish colored. So for example, like this. So to the human and the predator, the leaf looks different in, you know, when viewed under natural sunlight. Why does this become a problem? This becomes really a problem with psychophysics. Uh, it makes sense they'll look different. They have different eyes. We'd want to see that when they looked at the uh, different stimulus, right? The same stimulus, if they have different brains, of course, they respond differently. That's good. The problem is when we do psychophysics with a computer monitor or any experiment with the computer monitor to show the predator. While the human, the original natural leaf and the leaf on the computer look exactly the same because the monitors and cameras are built for humans. To the predator, they do not look the same. In fact, the response of the extra long wavelength cones in the predator will have a significantly lower response to this example uh, LCD monitor because the red emitting element uh, is basically too short wavelength to really uh, activate the uh, extra long wavelength cone that the predator had uh, and that was activated in the uh, natural leaf viewing situation. This is really a problem. So the sort of conclusion is that film, cameras, computer displays are all predicated on human eyes. And so we have to be careful. Even if we're not dealing with fictional predator uh, animals, of course, even for real animals like the common marmoset, which uh, I work with, there's genetic, uh, uh, many different, for example, phenotypes among the marmoset, uh, dichromats, trichromats, with wave differently uh, sensitive uh, cone receptors. Uh, and of course, even among humans, you have genetic variation or mutations uh, such as that cause things like color blindness or developmental variation causing different parts of the eyes to have different densities of different types of photoreceptors causing different uh, relative uh, color perception. Uh, so to give you an example of, of where this is important, I'll talk about an experiment we did earlier this year uh, that in which we showed humans, macaques, and marmosets uh, the same stimuli. Uh, and in this case, we were showing them uh, videos and looking, tracking their eye movements. And so for this, I'm going to talk about the uh, model analysis we did, which was just a basic bottom-up attention model called the saliency map. Uh, and for this, uh, we also tracked other things like uh, you know speed of eye movement, saccades, things like that. Um, but for this model, basically, we fed raw video input, video frames, into this saliency model, which separates it in you know, color, orientation, motion, luminance channels at different spatial scales, and then predicts where the animal will look based on that. And by comparing what the model predicts with where the animal actually looks, we can quantify uh, the receiver operating characteristic, the predictivity of the saliency map for where the animal will look. And we concluded in this, based on these analyses, that basically marmosets, macaques, and humans all look at salient targets at roughly equal, equal rates, with the ROC of about 0.6. Um, this becomes a problem when we, uh, or became a problem later on when I, we went to go and actually sort of brain experiments with these different subjects. Uh, so accepting the animal brain experiments, I'm going to talk first about where I found this problem, which was when I went to go do functional MRI scans of humans while they were viewing the same videos. And basically I found that uh, in, the project, in, the, in the fMRI machine, for whatever reason, the projector was projecting really dark stimuli. So this is how it should look, the left sRGB. This is how it did look at the beginning with their default calibration. And then after I calibrated it, it looked, of course, how it should, uh, which is what we wanted. But I'm going to go through what was wrong and why you have to be careful about these uh, type of things in your uh, experiments. So first of all, the default sRGB, which you'd expect to look just like the, you know, a, a computer also calibrated to sRGB, looked wildly bright. So basically any pixel, this is the input pixel, the number you send to the projector from the computer, and the output, the, the strength of the light that the, the pixel element uh, emits. Anything over about 70% of the uh, uh, maximum pixel value was output as the maximum luminance by the projector which explained why it looked so bright. Uh, in contrast, when in the low brightness mode, with the brightness set less, it didn't actually just reduce the brightness down. What it did was it, it, it moved this whole function down. So anything less than 50% of the max pixel was basically displayed as black, which is why it looked so dark. Uh, by the way, this dotted line here is a, a, represents a gamma exponential of, of 2.4, uh, and which is what you want for uh, approximating sort of RGB, standard red, green, blue which was the target. Uh, and so I calibrated it uh, and measured the uh, input-output, the, the transfer function using this uh, Color Data Spider X, a colorometer, uh, which are relatively cheap, and I, I recommend using, there's many different brands and things. Uh, and basically you show it, the, the projector here is projecting onto the screen, and I have the, this thing set up measuring the uh, amount of different 
wavelengths of light. And so I can convert from the red, green, blue space. Sorry, this says X, Y, Z. It's actually red, green, blue. I can measure for each pixel value of red, green, blue, what the output in X, Y, Z space. X, Y, Z space is a color space, uh, CIE made by the uh, sort of international uh, standardized color space to represent uh, sort of human per, uh, perception. And so I strongly recommend that everyone measures this transformation and publishes this data or make sure to keep it available so that uh, for reproducibility purposes and things like that. But this is, of course, not perfect. Even this CIE XYZ space, like I said, is based on human color perception, specifically the color matching experiments from the 30s, uh, 20s and 30s and more recently. So this leads us to the modeling problem. Uh, and this is basically how data is represented in the computer. Of course, in your computer, it's not represented in X, Y, Z space. It's represented in pixels, R, G, and B, which is actually implicitly usually in what's called standard red, green, blue. And this caused a problem. Uh, realized uh, I sort of made a mistake or an implicit assumption when I was feeding this video data to my saliency map model. I did not convert this in any way. I just fed the raw pixels, RGB pixels from this video frame in, right? But what do I actually want this to represent? The input to my model, should it be the stimulus that was seen on the monitor? In other words, the amount of light that's projected by the monitor? Or should it be something else? Should it be uh, the raw encoded values, the light projected by the monitor, the perception as seen by the photoreceptors of the subject? There's many different points from the transformation from camera input to computer representation to the dis display screen output to the psychometric uh, function that I could choose as the point at which to take it and add, uh, put the input into my model. Uh, and depending on at what point in this pipeline I choose, of course, the model input will be different. And so we'd expect the model output to be different, right? And so I tried this with uh, the saliency map model with our example uh, figure here. So first I input encoded uh, gamma compressed RGB values, just put the raw pixel values into the saliency map model and got it an output like this. Uh, whereas if I uh, correctly sort of gamma uncompress uh, or gamma expand those and do the weightings for the luminance of red, green, and blue, you get an a uh, response that looks like this. And you can see there's some difference between the outputs of the saliency map, which makes sense, of course. You're feeding it different input and getting different output. But this could lead to incorrect conclusions if you're doing something like, for example, separation of the different uh, feature channels to predict what's different between marmosets and macaques or humans. You might come to incorrect conclusions because, of course, you're feeding it the incorrect data that doesn't actually represent what the animal is seeing. So in conclusion, uh, I basically want to uh, sort of reiterate that the cameras, computer displays, and the data formats and the computers are all predicated on human perception. They're represented in a format that is intended only to be reprojected to be seen by human eyes. So it's really important, first of all, setting that aside, to enumerate your stimulus displays properties using a colorometer or something just for reproducibility purposes, and also, if possible, even to uh, find out the, the, uh, you know, the, the real uh, power spectrum of your uh, uh, computer display from the manufacturer or to measure it using a spectroradiometer. Third, and this is really important, the image understand and be very aware that the image and video data on your computer is implicitly encoded using these human implicit uh, uh, data uh, color spaces and so when you are doing modeling it's really important to be aware of at what point in that pipeline you are taking the image data and feeding it to your model what you want the input to represent uh, this leads to big limitations for of course animal modeling because even if you use any image data on your computer or video data on your computer to feed to a model of an animal, of course, it's not going to represent what the actual animal would see because the data is already super biased towards uh, being reprojected on a monitor built for being seen by human eyes. So just be very careful and very aware of that difference. Okay, thank you.